And Micah will be conducting the wedding, and I have the pleasure of sitting there and enjoying it. I'm looking forward to it. Now, we have another little family event. I got my slides out of order. Do we have the picture of Titus that we can put up there right now? There he is. Isn't that a cute little addition to our church family? <clears throat> now, a whole lot of praying went on to get Titus into this world, didn't it? And Titus has come, and for that we are grateful. So I just am praising the Lord here with you. And six pounds, three ounces, 19 and one-half inches. Glenn, you made sure that was an accurate number, didn't you? He did. He gave it to me this morning. We're grateful. Now, I have forgotten something. I'm going to come down here right now. Just a hair off the monitors, just a hair. I'm going to come down here right now and uh, for the mission trip. Now, Pastor Micah, Pastor Micah is leaving here this uh, coming Wednesday, Tuesday, and uh, uh, some are going this weekend. The group is leaving, so I guess we need to have a prayer of dedication for this mission trip, don't we? Our church, for about two weeks, is going to look pretty empty around here, and then it's going to fill up again because a lot of our church family is going to Panama and that's all right, so we're just going to adjust during those two weeks. I, uh, Dave Manahan will be preaching on the 13th. I'll be gone on the 13th. So we're going to have a little bit of a lull, and then we're online for the building program. So everybody here who's coming up the mission trip, come on up, elders of the church, let's surround them. I'm going to have a prayer of dedication. We do not want to miss this opportunity to have everybody here together, okay? Thank you. It's good to have you here. Good. We have some people out of state. That are coming to join us. Okay, well, we want them here. So let's get them all up here. And you, instead of a create, cre open up that area. Just wrap around in a semicircle. Just open up the center so that the congregation can see you. Come all the way back here. Come, come on back. Don't, don't stay there. Come all the way back. And we'll form up. We'll kneel here together. The elders of the church, come forward. Ordained elders, we're going to have a prayer here. And I don't have a microphone, but Terry, I'm going to ask you to have the special blessing for the entire group here. I didn't tell you to do that, but you're a man of the Spirit of God. You're going to have no problem doing that. And so let's get on our knees. Let's as the congregation. Let's kneel and ask for God's safety and God's blessing on all the events that are going to transpire here. And elders, just lay hands here on them as we dedicate them for this trip, and uh, we'll bow our heads as a church family. Okay. Kind Father in heaven, we kneel before you today because you are our God and our great God. And we praise your name, Lord, for your kindness to us all that is exhibited in so many different ways. And one of those ways, Lord, is this trip to Panama. We thank you that you've been in it, above it, through it. You've been overlooking it all. And Father, we just lift up all of these folks today that are going to Panama. We ask your blessings upon them. You ask that you would, we, you would give them insight and wisdom and all the skills needed to conduct your business in Panama. Lord, we, we need your protection. They need on, in the flight, in the traveling, and on site. Yes, Jesus. And they need your help in interaction with the folks there and with the other folks that will be there working alongside them. Yes, so Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we know that you'll do great things in Panama through your servants that are here before you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. God bless you. Real quick. Okay, real quick. Real quick. I got to <laughs> preach. <laughs> I, I just want to take a second and, and thank this church family. Um, we have not even left the country yet, and God is already just like a miracle. We, we have a family of six. You probably know them. That's $12,000 if you do the math. Guess what? They made it. God raised $12,000 for that family. Um, yeah. Um, it's my bus driver and my right-hand man, so uh, it's good. Uh, the Lord has blessed us this year. We have raised $88,000, 152 cents, and, or, or dollars and some change. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. Amen. Thank you so much. Pastor Mike is in his element when he's in a mission trip. You notice that? And 
Pastor Micah and Myers and Briggs is a sensory perceiver. They're action people. And that's when he's in his element. We're very grateful for the work that you and Tony and Linda, who's been involved in this travel agency thing, has been working for. Okay, let's shift real quick to the church slides before we begin our message here. Things are happening on the church site that are exciting. I am utterly thrilled about it. I want to just show, point it out to you. You'll look up there, and those are the walls going up for the gym, the fellowship hall. They're enclosing part of the structure this week and next week. Now, I don't know if they'll have the slab poured by next Sabbath or not. I'm going to call them, pause. You can see the picture there of some of the, of the, of the, of the siding going on, reaching hearts. I thought that was neat. But basically, next week, I'm hopeful that we can get under that canopy and have a group prayer together. Before everybody leaves for the mission trip on Sunday, we will see. They don't have the slab poured yet, so we're going to have to follow that by ear. But you can see here the walls going up. Move through the next one. I have a number of slides. Pause. You can see there the, uh, how, how huge that sanctuary slash gym is. My wide-angle zoom has compressed it. It's not as narrow as that. It's much wider. Continue. You can see there the, some of the sidings. I'm walking around the side of the building. Continue. There's some of the uh, support for the siding. Now, pause. Why are we? Why is the, this siding is made up of metal slash foam panels? We went this way so we could have the size of building we have. It will still last as long, but it, you can't burn this thing down as easy. Isn't that good? <clears throat> it's steel. Now we're going to have a ceiling sort of like this with lots of lights coming down. That's all right because the sanctuary is bigger. Otherwise, we couldn't have a church big enough to meet in it. It will feel closer than what we have here. I, I'm at a distance from you. you imagine me coming down there. And In fact, I'll, I'll show you right here. If you look at the sanctuary platform, uh, I will be standing about right here in relationship to the first chairs. So it'll be closer. Isn't that neat? It won't be as high up and distant. And it won't be as far back. It'll be about 13, 14 rows back. But then, you see how empty those corners are back there where my hands are? See where I'm pointing to the wall and the door? That'll be the largest side of the church. So it'll go deep into the corners as a wraparound. And then the glass walls, people who want to sit there with their children or the mother's room. About 100 people can fit in these two side rooms with glass, kind of like Spencerville. So on the main floor without the glass, we're looking at 550 plus seats. Now, how many seats are here? 380. There are 380 seats right here. I counted them. So we can grow in the sanctuary. It'll feel closer, but we can grow. And there will be, um, there will be a, a chance to grow. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Just a little more out in the main hall. Just up it a little bit. I get a chance to check out the sound here right there. Is that okay with you? We got it. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, go back and look at it. Now look at that. There's some of the uh, infrastructure for the Fellowship Hall. You see it right there. <clears throat> okay. Let's move to the next slide. Some more. I mean, this is... Micah, what is that? Is that like... It's casing. Okay. Cur curving for the what? Curving for the, AC units. curving for the AC unit. So that's good. Okay, continue. Next slide. You, all right, you're looking at the kitchen, unfinished, that open area. The wall is the outer boundary of it. And so one of the entry will be to the right. Our industrial kitchen will be right there. Move on. Again, a closer look at it. Linda, we're going to have that kitchen. Are you with me? <laughs> we're going to have the kitchen. Move to the next one here. Okay, the panels. Okay, that's the front, the entry toward the kitchen. Panels going on the side next to the kitchen that we just saw the entry there. They're doing grading work now. They're, they're, they're covering up the stormwater um, elements that, have, that are underwater. There won't be some st large stormwater pond. It'll be underneath the driveway. Cost us a half a million dollars. These were changes in, uh, imposed by the county. Do they make a big difference? Yeah, they cost us a half a million dollars, but we're getting them. And you can keep moving. You see those, that, that, the, uh, the wall there to the right? <clears throat> which is a um, block wall. Part of, you know, there'll be a stone veneer that runs along the bottom of the church. The cupola and the front of the church will have stone all the way up. Uh, an artificial stone looks just like stone. But that, those large uh, panels there will be solid stone, so it'll have a nice broken up effect. It will not look homogenous. It'll have character to it. Continue. 
And uh, you can see they're covering that, some of that up. Move to the next slide. Okay, keep going. That's the kitchen entry. All right, that's what I was talking about. Solid stone up, about a four feet uh, high stone bear, uh, sub-border. And then there'll be the ephus will be, look like stucco, earth-colored stucco with, with, with texture to it. So it'll look richer than if we had had metal panels on the front. That was a cost-saving measure, but it looks better. Continue. And uh, we'll have a beautiful forest green roof to the sanctuary. There, you see they're putting some of the roofing there on the ceiling. The roof is going on. It's a good thing because when that heat hit that roof without that insulation, you could hear it popping and crackling like it was raining right out there in the middle of the hot day. So they've got to get that under control. It'll happen. Some of the earth-moving equipment. Keep going. Next slide. Now I'm standing right at the door of the sanctuary looking up toward the cupola. That will be a canopy with an overhang and a large... Uh, a, 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 kind of like a towering and then affecting a cross at the top. I'm going into the sanctuary here. All right, that's the overhang. As I come in, uh, I'm looking to the side, making sure the block's right. Continue. I'm looking right into the sanctuary. That's it. And it will be, you know, there'll be a roof. That's just the artificial roof right now. I mean, the metal roof, but there'll be, you know, drop ceilings and stuff in place. Continue, moving in. That's our baptistry. That's the first concrete to be poured in the church. That's the foundation of this church is its baptistry. The most important thing in the church is for men and women to come to God's kingdom, be baptized, period, and become disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move to the next one. Okay, uh, you can see that. Baptistry again. It's getting dark, so I'd use my flash. Now, what are these orange lines? That's the demarcation line for the seat, sit, seating of the sanctuary. You see, the middle of that orange line to the right of it is that glass room I'm talking about. There'll be a hall even to the, the white line is the hall. And so that glass room is, right, pause, right there. To the left, you see the orange line. The right, you see the white line. The, that is that hall that is to my far right here. Actually, my far left as I'm staying on the pulpit there of that sanctuary, which will be the overflow room. There'll be one like it on the right. The left side will be glass, the right side will be a wall. John, that's where your Daniel seminars will be conducted in the future, is right there in that room. And it's bigger than the one you're using. Let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, they're putting some of the infrastructure in, as you can see there, for this, the baptistry. And uh, it's going underground, under concrete. That baptistry is in concrete. You can't get rid of the baptistry. Continue. Continue. And by the way, that baptistry, let me just show you where it's at. If you want to think of the platform as here, it's going to actually be a little bit more like there. It'll be, I'll, be preaching, I'll be preaching here, and the baptistry will be in the floor here. We'll pull the panels up. And when you want to see someone baptized, you'll come up and you'll stand right there. It'll, it'll be right here in the church. And I can baptize without having to change my clothes, which allows me the the privilege of being able to continue with the service. So that's great. I can baptize with help. Continue moving. Okay, that looks pretty good. Just move through the slides rapidly. We got it. So that's the update for the church. How many of you are excited about this thing? <laughs> I mean, this is electric, what's happening here. I, you, know, the, you know what the Lord wants to hear from us? He wants a grateful, heartfelt response because he has worked miracles for us. He has performed the impossible for us. And the future is alive. It's not about the past. It's not about where we came from. It's not about how long we've been here, Cedar Ridge. It's about the future. I'm excited. Thumbs up for God. What do you say? Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father God, we ask to continue to be as we have been called to be, men and women of faith who live for the Lord Jesus, who go home to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a certain sense out there that time is running out for the human family. Do you feel that? It's running out. People who do not believe in the Bible, they believe, they believe that we can only last so long on this very violent planet and a very ecologically damaged planet at that, and then time will run out and the human race will be no more. It is claimed by many thought leaders today that the human race's time on earth is almost over, and many scientists are making plans to back up the human race in outer space. 
You say, wait, what do you mean, Pastor Mike? That's right, back up the human race in outer space. Kind of like a cloud server. They plan to send the record of the human family, the human race, the family of humanity, with a little DNA into space so the human race can be recreated by E.T. somewhere out there and we can be saved by this uh, exporting of human DNA. The, the closest candidate for a habitable planet is 14 light years away and so we just aren't able to get there in a rocket ship. You say, well, why is that? Well, it will take thousands of years to get to the nearest star traveling with conventional methods. One light year is, guess, is this, is this uh, distance. I'll give it to you. It's 5,878,499,810,000 miles away. Alpha Centauri is like four light years away, our nearest star. Multiply that times 14 to the nearest inhabitable planet, and it's a huge number that makes a trip to the stars very impractical. Wagon trains won't work anymore. Can't do it that way. So the plan has been formulated, and some scientists are raising some serious money to make it happen, to back up the human family by sending messages, data, and human DNA into outer space. Using laser-propelled space vehicles, these time capsules will send the knowledge of our species in the deep space. Why? As I said, to save the human race, there is a plan. It's the ultimate prepper plan to save the DNA of humanity. The, the, the cloud idea may seem a little kooky here, but the aim is clear and the plan is in play to back up every family in principle by putting us out there. Th this morning, I'm going to ask you a very pointed question. What are you going to do for your family right here and down here on planet Earth as we near the end of time? What is your plan for your family? I ask you the serious question. It's not an emotional one. It's a thoughtful question. What is your plan to save your family from the awful things that are surely coming on this world? Because the Bible says they're coming on this world. What are you doing to save your family? Do you have an action plan not to save the human race? That's too big a task for you. God hasn't put that on your shoulders. But do you have an action plan that will save your family for the coming of Jesus Christ? Do you hear me? One of my favorite Bible verses in the entire Bible is found in Isaiah 59, 21. It will be the focus of our study, and then we will move to 1 Peter chapter 2. It is a promise for you and your children. You should write this promise down, hold it close to your heart, and live up to its principles so you can be ready for the coming of Christ. I have often read this verse at the dedication of children right here at Reaching Hearts. You've heard it many times. This morning, I'd like to introduce our subject with the two verses that immediately precede this passage in Isaiah 59, 21, and the verses that follow it. I want to see it in its context. Isaiah 59, verse 19 begins with the bold statement that a storm is coming upon this world, and God is coming from outer space to save that part of the human race that turns away from evil at the end of time. Take your Bibles, turn to the verse with me. Isaiah is, is writing here, So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. I don't know about you, I am looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want Christ to come. I do not want to live here forever. I mean, I'm happy to do the work of God, but I want to live in a different land. I want to breathe holy air. I want my children to live forever and never be tempted again for enemy and evil to be gone. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. In the Bible, God's law and God's name are the same thing. The text says, so they shall fear the name of the Lord. Friend, when you fear the name of the Lord, you aren't, in, you aren't terrorized by the Lord. You are really honoring His Ten Commandment law of love. Some people say, well, Pastor Mike, why do you have to talk about the law of God? I'm a new covenant loving Christian. Well, you aren't a loving Christian if you willfully set aside one precept of the Ten Commandment law of God. You do not qualify as a new covenant Christian. Because to be a new covenant Christian, God's covenant, which is his law, must be written on your heart. And when lawlessness increases, Jesus said, the love of many grows cold. But when the Holy Spirit brings the, the love and law of God into your heart, you're, you do not grow cold. You grow up into all things in God. 
Look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. Very clear, the connection between God's law and God's name is the same thing. It says, if you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. You see how if you fear the name of the Lord your God, you obey God, you keep his law? Here to fear the name of the Lord means to do all the words of the law of the Lord. So God's law and God's name are the same thing. You can't leave one letter out of God's name. Not one commandment of the ten must be missing if you honor God's name. Psalms 119, verse 55, very clear. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. You know, the Bible says, We shall not take the name of the, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not violate by a willful intention the removal. Uh, well, excuse me, you shall not remove the, the one principle of the Decalogue. That's what he's getting at. To make it empty is what the word vain means in Hebrew. So when you take one of the ten and you remove it from the ten and you only have nine, you have taken the name of the Lord God in vain. You have set aside His holy law. We need to teach our children that they can, by faith in Jesus, uh, listen to what I'm saying here. We need to teach our children that they can, by faith in Jesus, Obey the law of God because God's law and God's name are the same thing. And we need to teach them that when they, are, when they take the name of Christian, they take the Ten Commandments as the charter and constitution of the universe. The Bible says that God's glory is coming from the east. Let's look at Isaiah 59 verse 19 again. Isaiah 59 verse 19. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. In the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast goes on the forehead. And men and women at the end of time who reject the law of God, the law of love, the great Ten Commandment principles of God's name, will reject God. It's very clear. Why? Because God's name and God's law are really the same thing. God's glory in the text comes from the east. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation 7, 2. Here we can read very clearly that the seal of the living God, that part of God's law that is the seal of the living God, is pictured here, carried by an angel who comes from the east to place that seal on the foreheads of God's people. Revelation 7, verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascend from the rising of the sun, the east, and that's the Greek expression for east, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels. He had power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth. That means religious people. Or the sea. That means irreligious people in the book of Revelation. Or the trees. It means Sabbath keepers and law keepers in the book of Revelation. Till we have sealed the servants of our God upon their foreheads. God cares about the whole human race. He wants the entire human race to have the seal of the living God. In Revelation 14, 1, the name of God goes right where the seal goes. It goes on the forehead. So the seal goes on the forehead, the name of God goes on the forehead. Look at Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and on low on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, symbolic <clears throat> of God's people at the end who love him, who obey him, <clears throat> who had his name and his father's name written where? On their foreheads. So God's name, which is God's law, will be upon our foreheads and we will receive the seal of the living God. Now that's not legalism. Here's why. If you have Christ's name on your forehead and Christ's name is God's law, you have the love of God, you have Jesus Christ in your heart. Am I right? The new covenant experience of taking the law of God and writing your heart has become effectual by the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit working in your life. Isaiah 59, 19 says that God's glory is coming from the east and that God is coming for those who fear his name. In Matthew 24, 27, Jesus says his lightning shines from the east to the west. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. God's truth, God's glory, God's seal, God's Son is coming from the east to illumine the world with the glory of God. In the book of Revelation, there are three angels' messages that will be given to this planet before Jesus returns. And the first of the three has already started. It started in the 1800s. The first angel's message is a call to fear God in the right kind of way. And you say, well, Pastor Mike, why? Why does God want us to fear him? Friend, because the fear of the Lord overcomes the fear of the world in your life. 
The right kind of fear casts out fear. Revelation 14, 6, the first angel's message. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel. You know, that's one we can't improve on and we can't reinvent at the time of the end. It is true in Paul's day and the same gospel Jesus and Paul preached are, is the gospel that we must teach and preach with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And the word tribe can be translated family. Now look what it says next. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. We are to love God. That's what it's saying. We are to have a faith relationship with Christ at the time of the end because Christ is coming and the hour of his judgment has come. Revelation 14, 1, we are to honor God's name. So what exactly is the fear of the Lord? To fear the Lord's name means to keep his law of love by loving him back. The mark of the beast issue at the end of time is a life and death test in which it will seem like a good plan to break God's law to save your family from the beast power. The forces of evil will offer you a way out if you set aside the holy name of God, which is God's Ten Commandment law. And you go for the mark of the beast and the name of the beast instead of God's name. So when you give glory to God, <clears throat> you're really teaching your children to obey God and to love God and to fear His great and holy name. So if I were to ask you next week, what is God's name? Wouldn't you have to say it's the Ten Commandment law of God? That's what the Bible teaches. Deuteronomy 10, 12. That, that's why we keep the Sabbath. I mean, let's, let's just put it in you know, real terms here. What, what would it mean if you took one letter out of his name? One of the ten would be removed, right? The seventh day Sabbath is the seal of the living God. Because without it, Christianity does not have God's name on their forehead. It has part of it. God wants to put the seal on the forehead of his people so that they will know him by his name. The great I am God of the Exodus who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt has declared his name in the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I have commanded you today for your good. So there's no legalism here. God is calling us to obedience, to have a faith relationship with Him, and thereby have His name within us. We are living in a time when we cannot afford to let the world teach our children values. I mean, you, you, you better not plan on your school teaching your children values. Your children will be corrupted if that is the case. Your children need to know the Ten Commandment Law of God by memory, and they need to know it by example in your life. As parents, you need to show them, and they need to know that through Jesus Christ, they can obey God's law. You know, the last thing a child needs to be told today is, you, you know, Sonny, you know, we're all sinners. You really can't obey God's law. Don't you go tell your child that. You don't need a sociopath in your family. You need someone who loves God, who will be true to conscience as the needle of the pole. And guess what? Yeah, we've all messed up. You can be honest and transparent about that. But don't go telling your children that they need to fudge on God's law. You tell them to be true to God. <clears throat> they need to know that Christ died on the cross for sinners. So we don't want to be legalists here. And that we've all broken God's law. And that means you and your children too. You need to point them to a, a sin-forgiving Savior on the cross of Calvary. But do not set aside the law to get them to the cross. And they need to know that they can grow up to be men and women of God who live just like Jesus Christ did within their own sphere. Boys and girls for Jesus first, but men and women for God in the end. We need to quit setting the bar low for this generation. This generation needs a high bar because this generation is taking us home to glory. Christ is coming and the bar is very high. Isaiah 59, 19. Let's return to our passage. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. For He will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. The, Re the Revised Standard Version translation of Isaiah 59, 19 that we just read states that He will come like a rushing stream. This translation is not as literal as the Hebrew language here demands. The text literally reads in the Hebrew, For he will come like a river of distress or like a river of trouble with the Lord driving it. 
Now, many years ago, my son, John Michael, I shared this story with you before. I want to just repeat it for some who have not heard it here. I mean, it was an awful storm coming. We're in Michigan, Monroe, Michigan, where we used to live. <clears throat> it was coming from the north, blowing shingles off of houses, lightning, thunder, blackness, wind. And my son went right up to the window of the kitchen to look at the storm with his dancing up and down. He was just so happy. He pulled a chair up. He stood up there to the window. I went far back because I'd been struck by lightning. And I don't like storms. I was the coward. He was the hero there, I guess, in the kitchen that day. And then he began to jump up and down on the chair, and he said in baby talk, my oldest son, many years ago, he said, Dada, Dada, Jessa, Gama Tom, Dada, Jessa, Gama Tom, Dada. And I couldn't figure out what he was trying to say. I'm not that good at turning consonants and vowels into words when it's baby talk like this. And I'm bad with French and German too. I learned dead languages. It's hard for me to make sense out of that stuff. But then I got it. The Holy Spirit helped me to get what my son was trying to say. He was saying, Daddy, Jesus is coming in the storm. And he was waving his hands in joy. Daddy, Jesus is coming in the storm. Here I was in fear against the wall because of the lightning. Here he was looking at the lightning, looking for the glory of God to take us into glory. Man, I'm telling you, Sabbath schools work. He was taught that in Sabbath school by my wife and others. You get your ch children here to early Sabbath school, they can learn to be ready for the coming of Christ. And so what was happening was he was telling me, Dad, I'm so excited Christ is coming. Friend, Christ is coming in the storm. There is a storm that just precedes the coming of Christ. He is, he, he is driving the storm because he wants to come to, for your family. He's coming in the context of a trouble that will be out of control for many families here. So if you're trying to control the trouble in your life and in your family, friend, you need to understand that Jesus is coming at the end of time in the context of a fierce and terrible trouble, a terrible storm that you cannot manage in your life and that you cannot manage for your children's life. When I see trouble coming, I want to protect my family from that trouble, don't you? You like insurance? You don't? You don't like paying health insurance. Okay, I figured it out. Well, I have health insurance because I want to protect my family. It's costly. I have life insurance so that if I die, they will live. They'll, they'll go on. They'll be okay. I don't like trouble that's out of control. I don't like surprises that demoralize my family or me. I've had enough of those in life. I try to think ahead and find a way to maneuver around stuff that wipes out us, us out financially or that threatens my family emotionally. A good plan is half of what you need. But friends, there are some things you can't fully maneuver around. You cannot maneuver around the trouble that's coming upon the world. You cannot go around the trouble to get to Jesus. You've got to go through it. You've got to go through that final time of trouble. It's bigger than any of us. It will overtake all our families, and it will be like a storm, that, like no storm we've ever seen before. And no action plan for your family that's earthly in design will work if you are trying to avoid the stress and distress that comes at the time of the end. Preppers, you cannot prepare that way for the coming of Christ. If you're spending your time about some hideaway house, some food in the closet, that's not going to work. We will be homeless if we are faithful. We will trust angels for food. Stop wasting your time doing that. You need to prepare for the coming of Christ by preparing your life and others for the coming of Christ. God will take care of you. You know, it's foolish to think that way. We have been told by a special messenger to the remnant church that we are to make no special preparation for the time of trouble. And I believe her. Friend, avoidance is not a game plan, trying to prep your way out of the end. Avoidance is not a game plan that addresses the real challenge of the future for you and your family and how to face it. You must engage the future, not run from it. I think that Isaiah 59, 19 that we just read had Daniel 12, 1 in mind. Let's look at the verse. At that time, that's the great time, the end time. When the king of the north tries to kill everyone who's faithful to Christ. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Notice the certainty of the language. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. That's preparation. Your name needs to be in the book. I want my family delivered at the time of the end. I want to be delivered at the time of the end too. I want my name in the book of life right now. I want it to stay there. And I want my children's name in the book of life. I do not want to see my children or your children turn out as casualties in the future time of trouble. I say this with no apology. I want to be saved. 
Do you want to be saved? Say amen to that. Amen. We want to be saved because I'm concerned about what's coming on the world. I take the word of God seriously. So why is Christ coming to this world if it means such a hard time for all of our families at the end? Why do we have to go through this time of trouble the Bible talks about? There's a purpose in it. Look at Isaiah 59 verse 20. The Bible says, and he, it's speaking of Christ, will come to Zion as Redeemer to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. Friends, our children need to be taught that Jesus is the Redeemer. I mean, this all roads lead, all, ro all roads lead to God religion. You've heard it. It's foolishness. Christ leads to God. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no eclectic mixing of world religions that will save your children. The Christ who died on the cross will save your children. <clears throat> we need to be unabashedly Christian, committed to the person of Jesus Christ and his teachings. Christ is coming for our families who turn from transgression to their Redeemer. And you can't turn from transgression unless you have a Savior, a Redeemer, because the weight of sin will crush you. We are forgiven in Christ. We can turn from transgression because we have a Redeemer. In the book of Genesis, jo Jacob was spoiled rot, was a spoiled rotten son of Isaac, third generation after, second generation after Abraham, who lied to get ahead. He stole his brother's birthright. He was a mess. I mean, he was not like unlike many children who grow up whose parents are strong in the faith. He was not. The Lord disciplined him for it. Why? Because God loves our children who go wrong. He loves our children in the church who are experimenting with the evil, who are falling short, who think we're all fuzzy duzzies or whatever you want to call it because we don't do it the way they think we should. Years of suffering follow because he didn't just follow God like Abraham did. Finally, the Lord fought with him at the river Jabbok as he was coming back home to claim the birthright. And the Lord threw his hip out of joint. It was a physical fight with the pre-existent Christ at that river. But Jacob would not let him go. He would not let him go until he blessed him. And as he departed, the angel of the Lord, which is Christ in pre-existent form, said, What is your name? Now, why did he say that? He said it because he had lied. He said, My name was... Esau to claim the birthright to his father. He says, what is your name? He says, my name is Jacob. Now he told the truth. He said, you shall no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel because you have fought with God and prevailed. Friends, we are to fight with God on our knees with faith for the covenant blessings of God for our family. The time that immediately precedes the coming of Christ is called in Scripture Jacob's trouble. What Jacob went through is he fought with the Lord after he sinned. He pleaded with the Lord to bless him and his children. Friend, we are all going to go through that just before Jesus returns. The whole world will disappear as a support system for us. Jacob fought for the blessing in a season of trouble, and he persevered for his family to be blessed by God that night. And it became the night in which his future was transformed. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. I like that word saved. I want to be saved. I want my children, my family to be saved. Speaking of the Redeemer, our Redeemer, Jacob said this at the end of his life, Genesis 48, 16. Now, don't be spooked by this word angel, because very often in the Old Testament, Christ took the form of an angel, the angel of the Lord. He is not a created being, but he took the form of an angel to reach his ancient people. And here is the pre-existent Christ. Jacob is confessing at the end of his life, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Only Christ can do that. Bless the lads. Only Christ can do that. And in them let my name be perpetuated in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Jacob recognized that God redeemed him so he could be a blessing to his children and grandchildren. So if you want your children, your grandchildren to be blessed and saved, then you need to get right with God right now and not fool around with this thing. You need to get right with God in your life. He is the angel of the Lord who is the Lord. Christ is the Savior and Redeemer who can make a difference in your family. And your children need to have a blessing that comes from him, not only from you. You see... They won't know Jesus Christ in their life, in your home, or when they grow up. It's very unlikely unless they know Christ in your life, in your home, as they grow up. So if you're compromising the truth, you're playing around with it, you're not, you know, you just one of those slip and slide Christians, you know, you just, 
kind of wiggle in and out of church. You don't do much for God. You don't follow his word. You don't bother with supporting the mission of the church financially. Your kids see that. Why would they? Why would they if you don't? God is calling us to lead our kids to Christ, and who cares what it costs? Let's get them there. Isaiah 59, 20, 21, He will come to Zion as Redeemer to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. And then verse 21 is the promise that I like, that I've talked about and promised you here, that brings the blessing to your family, to you, to your children, to the children after them. It is the promise for the generations that follow you that, that learn the truth of a Redeemer. Look at verse 21. I've read this many times for children dedications in this place. And as for me, now God is speaking. He's very personal here. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. It means your children. My spirit which is upon you, my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your children or out of the mouth of your children's children, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Now what is Isaiah saying here as a spokesman for God? He's saying that God is ready to make a covenant with you and your family through his word. In the new covenant experience, he puts his Holy Spirit in us. He gives us a sanctified attitude so we can really live for Jesus Christ. He changes a flawed life that we all have. He changes an uncommitted life that we have all been. He changes a life that has been sullied by sin because we are sinners. He does that. And the heart he changes learns to obey and live for others, an unselfish life. And he does it by putting his words, his law, his name, through the Spirit of God into our thinking and lives. So if you want to have a changed life, if you want to have a future without the Word of God, you get nowhere. You need a Bible-based faith to live for Jesus Christ. If you want a blessing on your family and you don't have time for worship and the study of God's Word, then your family will not be blessed by God with the covenant that God wants to make with you for them. The blessing of the Spirit of God comes through the Word of God when it's taken seriously in your family, first by you as a parent. I was at a bank window yesterday. Have you ever had a hurry to get everything done on the Sabbath day? You know, you're racing. I, I found Josie at Sam's Club preparing for the picnic before the Sabbath. She got out of there before sunset. Josie, where are you? She's in the kitchen. She got out of there before sunset, so did I. Now, I almost didn't make it to the bank that closed at 6. I got there one minute late. I was speeding a little bit. I felt awful. That's why we have to confess our sins in the evening. I was going a little too fast. I got there to the window. I felt so disappointed. The lady was looking at me, and I went, I went like this, mercy, you know. She then cut the intercom on, what do you want? I need to make a deposit. It's, we're closed. I know. And then I smiled. She says, but you know what? For you, I'll do it. I pray for these people, these bank windows. She knew who I was. She knows I'm a pastor. She knows we have a church. She knows we pray for them. Every time we come and I make a deposit, I have a prayer for her family. Why not? Why not? I mean, look. I mean, your faith is either alive in the middle of the week or it's dead in the middle of the week. Why not pray for someone at a banquet? So I, she knew who I was. So I invited the woman teller who had just helped me to our church. It's, it's, bank, it's a bank of America down here off of, uh, what do you call it? It's not Cherry Hill Road, I think they call it. What? Briggs Cheney, exactly, Bank of America. Good bank, good bank teller, praying woman. I invited her to our church for the grand opening. Now, then she asked me a question. Are you a Holy Spirit-filled church? I said, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, do you get excited, you jump and holler. I said, no, we don't get excited and jump and holler a lot in the church, but we are a Holy Spirit-filled church. Well, how can you be that? I said, well, we're a Holy Spirit church because we get the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is alive, and we grow in God. We learn that we get happy, and we love people from the Bible. Christ is in the Word. I started thinking about that. So I started the teaching and preaching of the Bible is important. So at the grand opening, you be there. She said, I'll be there. Okay, so I'm, I bet all the bankers, the pawn shop dealers who are helping us get certain things for our new church. Well, why not go there? Don't they need to be in the kingdom of God too? I found some pretty nice people at these places down here. Man, a man by the name of Scott who I pray for at a pawn shop 
And Laurel, he's having some hard times in his business. I pray for him. He gave me a violin bow, which will end up with some student at some point in the future. You know, I like collecting violins for kids who need musical instruments. And it's one thing that gives me great joy. I've always wanted to learn to play a violin. Well, I can't play a violin. I don't have time to learn. So I tinker with it, make a few rotten sounds, and then I pass the violin on. And I find three and four thousand dollar value pot violins for two hundred or three hundred dollars, and I get them fixed up at Gail's Violin. It's just my thing, you know. When I get to heaven, the Lord's going to give me instant ability to play the violin. Don't give me a harp; give me a violin. So the Bible is very clear in the promise of Isaiah fifty nine twenty one. God puts His Spirit in you and the words you share with your children from His Word. In time, it becomes their word too, their experience too. Isaiah says, the words that I've put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth. You've got to stay consistent to win your children. We need to speak and speak a lot about our faith in Christ and the word of God. And when the word is in your mouth, it will end up in your children's mouth too. And then they will come to own what you believe because they will come to see that God's word is true for you. And they will teach their children like you did them. And then their words will be upon the mouths of their children too. That's what the covenant's about. You see, if it doesn't start with you, it doesn't start with them. If you don't, maybe you haven't prioritized prayer meeting that high in your week, you know? And that helps you to be faithful. When we, now, I realize we have small groups here. Some small groups function as prayer meetings. That's okay. But Wednesday night in the new church is going to be a family night with prayer, fellowship, and this kind of thing. And it, it's a time to grow together. If you believe, then why shouldn't, if you don't believe, then why should they believe? If you don't bear witness to God's power in your life, then why should they seek it or not in theirs? Why? Faith is a chain that is generational. If you break the link of faith in your life, then the chain isn't strong in their life. Many Christian parents today lose their children because they compromise the Word of God in their life. Now, there are some parents who lose their children because it's just an evil world and they've done their best and there's no reason. I'm not talking about you. God lost Lucifer that way. There are good parents who have been unable to keep their children. So we're not generalizing here. I'm talking about, about well, I'm not, saying, I'm, not, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions is what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is, is, as a principle, God will remember your commitment to your children even if that should happen and he will seek to save them in later life. He will not leave you uh, bereft of his promise and covenant. You know, we've all messed up to some degree as parents, haven't we? I mean, watched the wrong thing in front of our children, compromised here or there, without even knowing it because we live in a culture where it's easy. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I haven't. I have, and I, I've tried to find the right course in my life. But friend, your children know if you're able to get on your knees and ask for a Redeemer who will pardon your sins. And wouldn't it be nice for them to see you at your bedside asking God to forgive you? That will move your children to seek the same forgiveness from God. Our children need to see parents being real about their faith walk with Christ and their struggle to obey and their resolve to do so. I tell my children that I am flawed and that I lean on Jesus, my Redeemer, because of my weaknesses of character, my background. I, I would fall away quickly without Christ every day in my life. I tell them that I need forgiveness and the power of the gospel every minute of my life. Power to change me and grow me and keep me in Christ. I don't tell them I'm some perfect, big-shot, superstar saint, saint getting it right all the time, somehow perfect for the time of the end. I don't tell them lies like that. I tell them their dad is struggling at times. I've had my children, they've called me to pray for me. Dad, I feel like you're struggling. I'm going to pray for you. I, I do the same for them. I tell them that I need the Bible and I need Jesus every day, and I call them as adult children to pray for them. Christian mothers, I speak to you very directly right now. I appeal to you to not stand in the way of a Christian father who seeks to intercede in behalf of his children. I've seen that at times where a mother will stand between the father and the children when the father's trying to pray for that child. You stand aside and you let your husband do that. And Christian fathers, I appeal to you. Encourage the mothers of your children who support you to follow your leadership as a father and empower them also to pray for you and your children. You work together. Your, your, your children are the greatest joint investment in your life. Do not compete with each other for your children, but complement each other. Teach them the way of God. 
So what happens to the family that takes the word of God seriously in their home and life and their personal life? What kind of family is a covenant family with God? Isaiah 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The world today needs to see families that believe in the law of God, families that cherish the word of God, families that are not ashamed to call on Jesus as their redeemer and friend. You know, forget all this philosophical stuff that... Fake preachers throw out at you in the pulpit that won't save your family from the great time of trouble coming upon the world. It's worthless. Human ideas won't save your children. God's word will. God is calling on you as Christian parents to lead your family to become covenant partners held together in close-knit relationship to each other as you are surrendered to the word of God in your family. Worshiping families transformed by grace. Families of light, not families of darkness. Families that work in the church. Families that are willing to die for the church because it's Jesus' church. To become a family of light, friend, is the call of God for you and your family. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Apostle Peter had the privilege of opening the door to the Gentiles to accept Jesus Christ. Just before he died, he called to those new, new covenant believers, those Gentiles, he called out to them to reaffirm their faith in Christ. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. These were Gentiles, not Jews. He was talking to them like they were the children of Abraham because in Christ they are. So why did he say this? He said that, here's the reason, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Arise, shine. That's what Peter is saying. God chose your family for grace so your family can shine as light in the world that needs God's love and God's grace. God's covenant of peace, his holy name with your family, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is not just for you, it's for others too. You are to live for the church of Christ and others who need you in the world as light, God's family of light. Verse 10, once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Friend, Jesus is coming for families of light that obey him, that turn away from transgression, and that shine as light in the world. Friend, when Christ saves your life as he has at Calvary's cross, it's for a purpose. You are called to meaningful living. And don't forget the purpose of your light is to shine. I'd like to sing a little song and share our closing illustration with you. Can I have a young person, a little child, come up here? You come first. All right, Sophie, you come right here. I want you to cut this microphone on. I know your mommy taught you this song. If she didn't, I'm embarrassed. Okay, but we're going to work on that part. It's not about ego. I'll teach it to you if you don't know it. Do you know this little lad of mine? You don't know it. Get your mommy up here. Where's she at? I don't know where she is. She's in the kitchen. She's in the kitchen. Where's your daddy at? I don't know either. You don't know where he's at? Daddy! He's watching your, 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 your children out there and the children's room. Well, I really got myself into a pickle today, didn't I? Okay, you ever hear this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine? I heard it, but I don't know. Well, we're going to learn it together here. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. You did a good job. God bless you. But let's finish the song. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now you can teach your mommy that song. Your mommy grew up overseas, didn't she? So English songs, she learned uh, Russian songs, didn't she? You're bilingual. You go back. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> Francis Merrifield was a young man who fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. 
That was an important battle that helped to determine the course of our country's future. One year later, the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th of 1776, and we celebrate our independence ever after. Francis was 20 years old at the Battle of Bunker Hill, and he endured the trouble of the battle as a young man. It was a fierce battle, and he could have been killed. It was a time of distress that could have taken him down like the others, but he didn't die. It was a mysterious survival that he experienced. Over 100 of his fellow soldiers were killed that day on the field of battle, and 300 were wounded. Francis was one of the last to leave the field of conflict, and he survived to tell the story. When God redeems your life, friend, he redeems your life for a purpose. Next year, Francis Merrifield's Bible will find its place in the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. The notes in his Bible bear witness to a covenant he made with God that he passed on to his children after him. And so the chain of the covenant, forged by him by faith, was affirmed by his children, preserved in his Bible as the word in his mouth that became the word in their mouths and continued on to this day to was enshrined as a national treasure. Francis wrote a poem and he wrote a commitment to God in his personal Bible for his children to see. It became a family covenant, as I said. Here's what he said. I quote, Cambridge, June 17th, 1775. I desire to bless God for his kind appearance in delivering me and sparing my life in the late battle fought on Bunker's Hill. I desire to devote that, this spared life to his glory and honor as witness my hand, Francis Merrifield. Well, that may not seem like much. What he was saying was, God saved my life. I'm living for Christ from here on to the glory of God. His children saw that. His decision affected them. Now, have you written something like that down in your Bible? Are you marking up your Bible for your children? You should be. Or do you even have a Bible these days? Make the Bible the focus of your covenant renewal with God. Beneath these lines, he wrote a poem in hand in his Bible that I'll end with here today that speaks of faith, a future, and a family legacy. He wrote this, Oh, for a strong and lasting faith, to credit what the Almighty saith, to embrace the message of His Son, and call the joys of heaven my own. My spirit looks to God alone. My strength and refuge is His throne. In all my fears and all my straits, my soul on His salvation waits. Nothing but glory can suffice. The appetite, the ap nothing but glory can suffice. The appetite of grace. I wait, I long with restless eyes, longing to see thy face. As witness my hand, Francis Merrifield.
Dear Heavenly Father, we bow our heads today grateful that the covenant that Christ made at the foundation of the world reaffirmed your name, that it was eternal, the everlasting covenant. The law given at Sinai, you spelled it out in letters so we could understand what your name is, your covenant. And Father, we're grateful that you love our children. You love us. Save them by saving us first. To love you, to be forgiven, and to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we um, thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you for our family. We thank you for our church family. Today as we celebrate Jesus, we celebrate family, and we think about what you have called us to as parents and, and the older generations in the church leading and teaching the young. Lord, we pray that you would hold us to a high standard and that we would we would meet that because of Jesus and that um, because that is witnessed by the young people, Lord, we would grow together into your kingdom. Thank you for this food and for a time to share it together and celebrate the generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.